Hello and welcome to part one of my intro Hanabi strategy guide. My name is Piano Bluke, and I'm super excited to share this. First, I gotta give a few really big shout outs. I promise I won't do this in future videos, but this just uh, has to come first. Obviously, first, huge shout out to Antoine Bauza for designing this game. Please go support him, buy his games. Yeah. Uh, second of all, huge shout out to my friend and teammate Piper, who collaborated with me to make this deck. So what we're actually going to be watching is a, a replay, a, a fake game that never actually existed amongst four fake players. And thank you to Zamiel also, especially for maintaining this awesome fan website that you're seeing in front of you. Okay, with that out of the way, let's jump in. If you don't actually know how to play Hanabi yet, uh, I'll link some resources in the description. This, this does assume that you actually know literally the rules of how to play. This is a strategy video. And in case you've never seen this website's UI before, each of these is one person's hand. And what we're watching is sort of this overhead view of the replay after the game has ended. My hope for this video is that just armed with the strategies I share here, that you and your friends could probably go and beat a good chunk, if not the majority of games of Hanabi. Like, and I mean like get a perfect score. So it all just follows from a few really basic strategic principles. The main one is just to realize that the only way to win this game is by getting cards played. <laughs> and the only way to get cards played is to efficiently clue the cards to get them played. Now, maybe that sounds obvious, but uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see beginners do is just like to just sort of give good looking clues. So for example, maybe this looks appealing to say, hey, you've got two fours. And so now with one clue, you've touched two cards. But the problem is we haven't actually advanced our goals, right? This clue will not help us play any cards. Fours would not lose us the game if we discarded them. So it's just sort of like, okay, cool. There are some fours. <laughs> which brings me to a first real strategic principle, which is that each clue you give should really do one of two things. It should either get at least one new card played or save at least one important card that needs to be saved. And actually, literally all the clues you'll see in this game follow from that principle. Play cards, save cards, you'll be golden. <laughs> all right, so the first clue of the game, Alice wants to get this green one played. So Alice clues green. You might think, well, heck, Bob knows it's a green card, but what should make him think it's exactly a green one? Well, actually, it follows from the principle we just talked about. Because Bob knows that Alice's clue must be getting a card played, he actually knows that this must be exactly green one, right? Because if it, if it wasn't, why would Alice be cluing it? Sure enough, Bob can go ahead and just play the card. We call this a one for one. One clue, one card. Uh, honestly, that's not a great exchange. Because remember, we only, we only have eight clues to start. So when you can manage to, it's actually really awesome if you can get multiple cards touched with a single clue. So check out what Kathy does here. She's able to pick up two cards. Now once again, it's Donald's turn. He can very much trust that he must have the red one. But which card should he assume it is? So that brings us to the second principle, which is the idea of card focus. Uh, so we agree that Whenever a clue is given, even if it touches multiple new cards, it's really only focusing, it's only like shining a spotlight on one card. And normally, we agree that it's most likely that the leftmost card is the card being focused. Now, the reason why we agree that it's most likely the leftmost card is you'll notice that whenever a card is played or discarded, uh, the new card appears on the left. So throughout the whole game, new cards are going to be appearing on the left, while the older cards in your hand are going to be sliding towards the back of your hand to the right. Um, we call the rightmost card the chop, because it's a, on your chopping block. So Donald plays this, and sure enough, it works out. Now Donald is left with another red card in his hand. And I'll note, because this card was not actually focused, there was never a spotlight on this card. Donald should just trust that this could be literally any useful red card. And this is actually our next 
general principle is the idea of good touch. And what I mean by that? We call the cards being clued as being touched. If Kathy decided it was useful to touch this card too in the clue, Donald should really trust that it's it's probably a useful card. He doesn't know what it is, but he can hold on to it. And now the whole team should trust Donald will not go and discard this card. So as an effect of this concept, right, as cards get touched but not focused, you'll start amassing more useful cards that you know some information about and will will get played later on in the game. So I've seen a couple of straightforward play clues, and Hanabi would be ridiculously easy if that's all the game was, was just touching cards saying, hey, play this, hey, play this. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, it's not that easy. If you think about the whole system of this game, you have to get cards played, and you get cards played by touching cards. But the only way to touch cards is to clue the cards. And the main way to get clues back in this game is to discard cards. Now, we already talked about how new cards are going to be coming in to the left side of your hand, and the older cards are going to stagnate towards the back right side. So therefore, and here comes the next general principle here, we agree to always discard from the right hand rightmost side. Because in general, these cards furthest back on the right are going to be the ones that have been sitting there the longest and have never been clued. And if they're not getting clued, it's probably because they're not very exciting. With that principle established, if you see an important card on someone's chop, chopping block, it's actually incredibly important to clue it because otherwise they're going to just discard it. This means that the team has to work hard to keep people's chop safe from discarding important cards. So sure enough, Alice goes ahead and clues fives to Bob, telling him, Oi, these cards are fives. Do not discard them. And now that these are touched, right, you'll notice his chop has moved to this card. But we shouldn't be discarding yet because there's a lot of important stuff to do. The most important thing that Bob sees going on is that actually Kathy's chop is incredibly important too. Kathy's about to discard this blue one. Bob can actually clue blue here as a play clue. But wait, you might say, we just talked about how if multiple cards are touched and a clue, shouldn't Kathy assume that it's the leftmost card? Well, no, because of this chop focus principle. We just talked about how cards on your chop are incredibly important, and therefore we actually assign like a premium value to your chop card. So if you get a clue that newly touches multiple cards, one of which being on your chop, so the card you're about to discard, that actually swerves the spotlight to this card, and we call that a chop-focused clue. So, yes, Kathy should still trust that this is some useful card, but the, the star of the show here, the star of the clue, is the card that she would have just discarded. Uh, this Learning about this convention blew my mind, and like just that idea alone drastically improved my gameplay, so it's magical. Okay, moving on. Now, Kathy knows about the blue one, but this is a team game, and Kathy sees other stuff that needs to be done. Most noticeably, there's there's trouble brewing up in Alice's hand. Unbeknownst to her, uh, her chop is extremely scary right now. Which brings us to our next principle. <laughs> when we see twos on the chop, generally it is expected and very good practice to not let twos get discarded. So if you only see one copy of a certain two on the field, just imagine, if, if we let this card get discarded, uh, what if the only other copy of this two was near the bottom of this deck? Even if it was in the bottom, like, ten cards or so, the whole yellow suit might get held up. And actually, if the other copy was in the bottom couple of cards, it could even be impossible to win the game. So, two saves are important, and Kathy scrambles to tell Alice to not discard this card. Now it's Donald's turn, and there is another issue brewing. But that's no problem, because Donald can just save it. Now notice how the team has all been working together to clue these important cards that would have otherwise been discarded. Well, now it's Alice's turn, and you might think now that it's very tempting that one of her twos is playable, right? What if, what if Kathy was actually trying to tell her to play her card here, right? But I'd say that's an extremely dangerous and unnecessary way to play, and actually, you basically never want to ask yourself that question, what are the odds? <laughs> 
this is not really a game of rolling the dice to see if you get lucky. Maybe this is green too. But then again, maybe it's not. <laughs> and like, maybe this other two is green too, but if nothing else, just trust your team that they would have chosen a different line to take, right? So, I mean, just, just as an example, right? Let's say this two was actually a green two. You can see that then it could be clued that way, right? Let's say Kathy plays, and Donald could simply give a play clue. Or if you remember the chop focus rule, you can notice even in this case, Donald could give a chop focused play clue here, right? So you can see now how these principles are started, starting to work together to make a really cohesive strategy. And you can start really reading into the clues and trusting your teammates in some really cool ways. So with all that said, right, it actually makes a lot of sense that this two on Alice's chop is not playable. We're on to the last two turns of this video before I split into part two. And now we're going to talk about delayed play clues. So far, every, every clue that we've seen has been like a direct, hey, this is a card and you can play it now. And again, hey, this is playable, you could play it. But that is not always the case. Alice, on her turn, she sees a red two already touched and now she sees the red three and the red four. So this is kind of exciting, right? And we like to think of this card as actually being quote unquote playable. It's actually very important that Alice not let Bob discard it. You, we never want to let playable cards get wasted because remember, the only way to win the game is to get cards played. So sure enough, Alice can clue this red and there is no risk here. Now, if Bob was a complete beginner, his first reaction might naturally be, oh, it must be the red too, I'm gonna play it. But no, the first thing he should do is look around at his teammate's hand. And sure enough, he looks down to Donald's hand where Donald has the red too. So why on earth would Alice be cluing this if it's red too, right? In fact, this is what we call a delayed play clue on the connecting card. And now this is really cool, right? With this one clue, Alice is sending a message to two players. I mean, to Bob, it's saying, hey, this card will be playable soon. And to Donald, it's saying, hey, to make this playable, you must have the red two. So we call this a prompt, which is super cool. And the last turn of the game, now that Bob sees he has the red three, he sees the red four, nice and easily clued. He checks one last time to make sure that no fives or twos or playables are being left to die. With all that out of the way, Bob spends the team's last clue to get this four. With everything we've talked about so far, which way do you think Bob should clue this four? Should he do red or should he do four? With all this strategy in mind. Pause and think about that. How to get this red four. All right, and the answer is, it turns out four is actually really powerful. I mean, red works, but remember, by the good touch principle, it's really useful to pick up extra good cards. Um, and now that this is touched, Kathy will know that she should not discard it later. And also by chop focus, this is the other tricky part of this clue. Remember, because we trust that the focus of the clue is gonna be on your chop card, Bob knows that Kathy will mark this card that was on her chop as the focus. So finally, at long last, the team has done awesome work getting all the cards, all the playable cards clued, all the important cards saved, and finally, they can just start playing cards, and Alice can breathe a sigh of relief and discard the first discard of the game. <laughs> and with that, part one is over. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Part two actually continues from where we leave off, so as a teaser, it is now Bob's turn, and I'll leave you with the question, what should Bob do on this turn?